Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. There are moments when large themes of international tension are condensed into the real-life drama of a lone individual. The extraordinary ordeal borne by Halaya Asfandiari during her eight-month detainment in Iran is such an occasion. It is a story of individual courage, institutional resolve, and international concern. The questions it raises are important. They range from the claim to just treatment that should be the birthright of everyone to the dangerous cross-currents of Middle East politics. This week and next, we will discuss this full range of issues with Dr. Haleas Fandiari, head of the Middle East program at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and Dr. Shaul Bakash, Robinson Professor of History at George Mason University. Hale and Shaul, welcome to Dialogue. Thank you. Uh, one of many welcomes. Good to see, <laughs> <laughs> to see you back here again. And yeah. let me say right at the start, um, Hale, that the beginning of this terrible tale reminds me uh, almost of a Graham Greene novel, a Graham Greene novel set in the Cold War with its tales of espionage and uh, high drama. You're in a cab going to an airport set upon by three knife-wielding thugs who steal your documents. That alone would be terrible enough, but when did you know or begin to sense that more was involved in than just that incident? For the first um, two, three days, I assumed that this was a regular robbery because um, after it happened, I went to the headquarters of the police department in our neighborhood reported the theft. Um, I went to the judiciary office there, reported the theft there too. Went to the foreign ministry, uh, reported the theft because my passport was, my Iranian passport was issued in right. Washington. Right. But um, I was told that in order to get a new passport, I would need a letter from the president's office, i.e. the intelligence ministry, mm. which has a branch in the passport office in uh, Tehran, the main right. passport office. And when I went there and asked for the letter, they said, well, there are some questions. Someone is going to ask you some questions. Come back tomorrow morning. Mm. So I went back the next day. And the guy started asking questions which went beyond your sort of where were you born and right. age, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and he said, could you come back the next day? And the next day, of course, when I went back to the passport office, I was told to go to another office. Mm. And within three, four days, I decided that Right. There is more to it than what it seemed at first. And the more to it became house detention first and then eventually prison. I was prison never then. under house detention. Mm -hmm. You know, I was under country detention right. because I didn't have a passport to leave the country. Mm -hmm. No, I was free to go wherever I wanted. Whether I was followed, I don't know. Right. I assume I was. Do you, looking back, Holly, do you feel um, in retrospect that there was anything in the political air of Iran at that point. Was there any sense of foreboding at all? Had, had things been happening to other people that had uh, concerned you? Sure, things had happened to other people a year before. Mm. Um, and uh, an intellectual um, who had also spoken at the Wilson Center, Ramin John Beglu, was stopped at the airport when he wanted to go to Brussels to attend a conference. Right. He was detained for four months and then, uh, you know, prob questioned. A group of women who, activists who, had demonstrated in Tehran, mm -hmm. where also some of them were detained. Right. So sure, yes, there was something in the air, but I never thought that you know this would happen to me yeah. because I'm not an activist. Right. You know, both of these people, mm -hmm. both the women who were arrested and Ramin were in a, their own way activists, but I was not. So 
I didn't expect it to happen to me. You know, it's interesting, and uh, of course, uh, Shaul, not just as Robinson history a professor, uh, Robinson uh, uh, professor of history at <laughs> George Mason, but also as Hala's husband, that you are immediately caught up in this story as well as it's evolving. And I'm wondering about the communication between the two of you in the early weeks and months as things began to take place. To put it specifically, Shaul, um, I'm sure that Hala, to the extent she could get information to you, might have been trying to be as reassuring as possible. How were you reading the situation, and do you feel you were getting the same information that she was getting? Well, I was hearing by telephone from Hale as long as she was free and not yet um, in Evin prison. Mm -hmm. And so she was giving me the information she had. I, too, initially thought this was a plain robbery. But once <clears throat> what became really a lengthy interrogation began, it was clear that the, that the robbery was part of the plan to detain her in Iran mm -hmm. so as to interrogate <clears throat> and eventually <clears throat> imprison her. Um, Hale was able to give me every evening a full account of that day's interrogation, so I was very aware of the questions she was being asked. And don't forget, they were asking her for information about the activities of the Wilson Center. Right. And so this engaged and involved the Wilson Center staff, and to a certain extent myself as well as the channel through which mm -hmm. this very voluminous information was relayed every evening by email to Tehran. You know, both of you uh, are clearly uh, with strong Iranian, your own Iranian backgrounds and with your, your scholarship, your focus on the, on the country and the region. Did you feel, and I guess this is to both of you, initially at least, that this was something that should be treated procedurally, I hate to use the word underplayed, but sort of taken as uh, something happening and rather than escalated or, or treated as the political incident it became? Well, yes, initially we decided that we shouldn't publicize it, we shouldn't make a huge fuss. As usual, you think in these situations, if you're quiet, if you downplay it, right. everything is going to turn out all right. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, a common decision was taken by Hale in Tehran, by myself here in Washington, and by the Wilson Center, mm -hmm. that we shouldn't publicize the fact that she was being interrogated. Right. Well, as usual, it proved wrong. I mean, four months of quiet uh, led only to her being jailed rather yeah. than helping us at all. Um, George, I think I would disagree with Shaul. I don't think this was a wrong decision, at least for the first two months, because according to Iranian law, if you lose your passport, it will take six months to issue you a new passport. So that was the argument that some people who were trying to intercede on my behalf locally would tell me, tell me, as long as we are told that, look, this is a normal procedure, right. which I knew it was not a normal procedure, being interrogated eight hours, nine hours a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, their uh, advice was that let's keep it quiet mm -hmm. and then wait and see where it will take us. Maybe after two months, when it didn't get us anywhere, mm -hmm. we should have gone public. But I still was hoping that mm -hmm. uh, without making an incident out of right. this issue, maybe they will allow me to leave mm -hmm. the country. You know? Let me go to a, a very <coughs> central question. I mean, it's, not, it's an, an obvious one behind all this. What did they fear? You know, why did this whole thing happen? I, now, we've all heard the, the, um, the, the claims by the Iranian government that this they saw Halle as a as a conspirator, a ringleader in a, in a plot to, uh, to start a soft revolution. But I would, I'd love to get your views on what's the paranoia? What was the fear in the Iranian government that made them act this way? Um, at least the, the explanation I was given, both outside prison and inside prison, was that the American government, you know, is using think tanks, mm -hmm. foundations, mm -hmm. universities, as an instrument to penetrate and infiltrate Iranian society, empower the NGOs, be it women NGOs or other NGOs, mm -hmm. and 
create a network of like-minded people who will then push for change and eventually overthrow the regime. Mm -hmm. And that was their fear. And I tried, I'm not talking outside, over this, my stay outside the prison. I tried to explain to them how American foundations work. The little right. I knew about right. it, you know, I, I wasn't familiar mm -hmm. with what foundations do, how think tanks work. And I tried to explain that the Wilson Center is neither a foundation nor a think tank. Right. It's an institute for advanced studies and so on. But I was not able to convince them. They were sure that there was a hidden agenda. Mm -hmm. And they kept on pressing me for that hidden agenda. Mm -hmm. which I didn't have a clue. I mean, there is no such thing as a hidden agenda. Yeah, so you're talking so, essentially to a brick wall, basically, on, exactly. that, on that point. That's right. Uh, did you see it that way, Shaul? And, and, uh, and also, in, in your answer, uh, do you see it as the action of a united or a divided government? I mean, was this the totality of the Iranian government adopting this position or one segment or sector perhaps acting on its own? Well, it certainly reflects the views of the Ministry of Intelligence. Mm -hmm and certainly a unit within it that uh, um, is um, responsible for countering mm -hmm. what they call soft or velvet revolutions. Um, and yes, they seem convinced that uh, um, by inviting scholars to the United States, by giving them research grants, by uh, inviting them to conferences and um, putting them into touch and contact with um, American scholars and academics and the like, that the aim of the United States is to create a network of mm. individuals who either unknowingly or willfully will then help bring about a, uh, a velvet uh, revolution mm. in Iran of the kind that occurred in the former Soviet republics in right. East Europe and Central Asia. I'm, I'm uh, very uh, uh, impressed with that answer because it strikes me as I listen to you that they are paying attention to those developments in East Ukraine uh, specifically, and they see that as a threat to their stability. Uh, and uh, certainly they have been paying attention to the, those developments, mm -hmm. and it could well be mm -hmm. that you know, intelligence sharing between the Iranian intelligence ministry and their Soviet or their Russian counterpart mm -hmm. has reinforced this belief that there's some vast plot mm. and that the East European and Central Asian Velvet revolutions took place not because of a spontaneous uprising uh, by the people themselves, but through American machina ma machinations. That's also very helpful. It's the first time I've heard anyone mention the possibility of Iranian-Russian uh, intelligence cooperation leading them to this suspicion. So that's very telling. Well, yes, obviously we don't know that for a fact, but mm -hmm. it, it, it does seem to be the case. Yeah. You know, at the heart of the story, clearly, is what happens to you in prison, Halei. Those, those four months that you spend in solitary confinement. And as a layperson, as a friend, as a colleague, as someone, uh, one of the many people throughout the world caught up in this, I can only ask you, what was it like? First of all, it came as a shock to me. I didn't expect to be taken into prison, especially since the night before. Uh, we had received a phone call saying that it's all settled, it's all solved, you'll get your passport and you'll be able to leave the country. Mm -hmm. But I had an intuition. My sixth sense told me that this can't be. So I sent an email to Shaul saying that I think this is my last supper in Frida. Mm -hmm. It was just an intuition. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, and the next day, lo and behold, I was taken to, uh, to prison. Once the door of the room I was kept in, were, I had two doors in that room were closed, it dawned on me that this is going to be my home for the next two days, five days, 10 days, two months. But I never thought that they would keep me for four months. Mm -hmm. I really thought that I would be set free uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. So the life was, you know, solitary confinement is very tough, is very hard on you, no matter how comfortable mm -hmm. your room is. You know, I had, I had the room with a 
metal sink in it. Mm -hmm. One of the two faucets didn't work. A couple of blankets to sleep on. Um, I asked for a desk. They provided me with a desk because there was no way I could sit on the floor and read and, and write. And then I decided I'm not going to write anything because every piece of paper I wrote, they would take and read and then probably ask more questions. Yeah. On those questions, what was the method of the interrogation? For example, was it as we are now, face to face uh, mm -hmm. and back and forth, or what was it? Um, you know, I had two interrogators. The one interrogator that interrogated me outside the prison was with me also in prison. Mm -hmm. But then the first day when we went into, I was called in for interrogation in prison. I was blindfolded because I'm taken to, to the room and uh, I was told to sit and face the wall because his boss was going to come and ask questions. And basically, uh, you know, when he was there, I would always face the wall, of course, without blind, <laughs> mm -hmm. without the mask, because I was, I had to write the questions. First, we would do oral questions and answers, and then I had to answer each question in writing. Yeah. So, um, and then, but the interrogation in prison basically never lasted more than three, four hours, mm -hmm. because there was nothing to, talk about. I'd, I'd been interrogated outside prison eight to nine hours a day for all that period. So, I mean, we went over some of the material I had already covered. The only difference was that four months later, I'd forgotten half of the things I <laughs> told them. So I just couldn't even provide them with the That's same right. answer. And they would say, yeah, right. but you said this. I said, okay, mm -hmm. since it's in writing, show it to me, I'll repeat it. I can't remember. Well, you know, I can only comment, it has to take enormous internal spiritual strength to endure this, particularly it, because you have no idea when, it, when it's going to end, if it's exactly, ever going to end. Exactly. And in that context, Shaul, since you also hadn't had no sense of when it was going to end, when did you begin to feel that we, it had to be treated differently, that there had to be a different kind of response from the world, uh, from America, from people concerned everywhere. When did, when did your mind shift on Well, that? once Halle was taken to Evin prison um, on May 8, I think it was, uh, clearly the regime in Iran, from my point of view, had crossed the line. Mm -hmm. And that was the morning we decided to go public and to mobilize insofar as we could uh, media attention and public opinion um, in support of Halle. I should also say that, frankly, we initially, I mean, I and, and the Wilson Center staff didn't think we could keep this story going for more than three days. <laughs> but it was extraordinary, yes, yeah. the uh -huh. attention. Uh, this dramatic story attracted right. in the world's media and, uh, and the public support of volunteer groups and women's movements and the like uh, we received was very extraordinary and, and heartwarming. You know, it, uh, just by way of comment, I think one of the reasons other than the ordeal itself is because as human beings we're drawn to the ordeal of a single person who kind of focuses all of our our greatest fears and what, what she has to undergo. You know, uh, George, I had warned the interrogator that don't underestimate the personality and the influence of Lee Hamilton. I said, I really had warned them. I said, if you harm me or if you take me to prison, and this was, you know, way before I was taken in, at the beginning, that he can pick up the phone and talk to every foreign minister, every head of state, and you will have an avalanche of people calling you the like of it you have not seen. Mm. So don't mess up with someone who works for Lee Hamilton. Right. But they didn't believe me until it happened. Until it came to pass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, now yeah. we're, we're speaking clearly about how this is going to be treated and the reaction to things as they developed. And let me ask a couple of questions on this very specific thing about the later stages and the aftermath. Um, on the aftermath, when you're finally released, Tala, what, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 
interested in your sense of the reaction in Iran. Uh, did you have a sense of how people that you had a chance to meet with felt about all of this? As long as I was in prison, George, I didn't know what was going on in the outside world. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got access to TV and newspaper, nobody was talking about me anymore, you know. So I was never mentioned in the Persian right. papers, maybe once or twice, saying that, you know, mm -hmm. they are still looking but into do, do my case. They were, but mm -hmm. they were astounded by the world reaction? Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really think they never thought this would happen mm -hmm. to them. They mm -hmm. really, but they never told me. Yeah. So I wasn't aware. There were occasions when I would think, Everybody has forgotten me. Mm. It just, it's, I knew that Shaul probably would not, but I said, what can he do on his own? Little did I know what was going on. But also in Iran, I mean, once I was sent home and set free, I spent 10 days before leaving the country. Wherever I went, people would recognize me and they would, some would come up to me and say, you know, we are so proud of you. Mm. But I, I didn't know why they were proud of well, me. But, but, you know, even I remember uh -huh. I went to an office to get a copy of my ID card and the man came up to me and said, um, can I take a picture with you? And I said, no, 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 no. Yeah. Because, you know, I thought maybe this is also planted. Right. You know, so I said, I said well, Hala, I don't have to ask the question. <laughs> I know why we're proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and this, it's also a good, uh, good opportunity to, to hold up the book that you wrote, of course, before you, this all happened to you on uh, women in Islam, Reconstructed Lives. And it occurred to me as I reread this, Hala, and I knew we were going to talk, that you could be one of the people in your own book now. <laughs> and, and, and this way, and let me focus this as a question. It, it occurs to me, and I hope I'm not overdoing this, but that people like you and Shireen Abadi, who is herself an Iranian, now represent perhaps something new for the Iranian government to deal with. That is women who have uh, achieved a high degree of uh, recognition in the world for human rights issues. Do you think that is now a, a factor? Um, Shirin Ebadi is a very special case. She really is a very brave, courageous woman. She, um, you know, she's the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, mm -hmm. and uh, she does a lot of pro bono work, mm -hmm. you know. She represents the students. She represents people like me. She was my lawyer. Mm -hmm. so, but although I never met her inside prison, they even didn't allow her to look at my file. But, um, um, you know, in Iran, there are quite a number of uh, women activists, right, right. yes. But she's in a different category. Really. Speaking of women, uh, activists or not, and their reactions to this, um, I'm interested in your reaction, your sense of, of, of that factor. For example, uh, I think Arab women, uh, perhaps to your surprise, were particularly vocal in seeking your release. And, uh, George, the reason was that over the years that I've been working at the Wilson Center, I've uh, hosted a number of workshops in the region, in Beirut, in Amman, bringing in Iraqi women and also women from the Persian Gulf states and from the region, you know, all the way from Tunisia to, mm -hmm. to Iran. Mm -hmm. So there was a network of women who knew me and each of them started contacting other women. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there was that whole campaign of Arab Muslim women right. who did all they could, you know, to get me out. After having, uh, having asked you a couple of questions about the immediate aftermath, let me ask you about the aftermath plus the future, both of you. Because you're both committed to international dialogue. You're both committed to exchange. The irony of this entire situation is that it's kind of a refute, or not a refutation, but an attack upon the kinds of things you've, you've stood for. So I guess the question is a simple one. Do you still uh, believe in the uh, need for international dialogue, however difficult, with Iran? Uh, in America? Is it something you, we still should be seeking with equal fervor? Oh, I think definitely so. Uh, obviously, both between the two societies or the I Iranian society and the international community, mm -hmm. but also between um, government officials on both sides. The, the wall of suspicion and mistrust that has been built up can only be brought down mm -hmm. 
uh, through dialogue and uh, exchanges and, and negotiations. It's going to be very, very tough. And you are dealing with, um, in Iran, with uh, some hardliners who you cannot convince um, of the desirability of dialogue no matter what you do. But that's not the entire regime and certainly not the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to me that uh, we do need to talk. Mm -hmm. Would you share that? Halle? Oh, definitely, mm -hmm. George. You know, I distance myself from what happened to me, you know, and I believe that the two governments should sit and talk. And at this stage, I think we have exhausted track to diplomacy, uh, you know, NGO activities and so on. This should continue, you know, but Basically, the two governments should sit and talk to each other. Knowing the Iranian society, nothing will happen until the officials mm -hmm. sit at the same table with the Americans and talk to them. Well, I personally have to agree with both of you. And I also wonder, since so much of Iran is so young, isn't this really something that one can be more hopeful about as the future goes on, that we're essentially talking to new generations all the time? <clears throat> oh, yes, I think so. I mean, uh, such a large portion of the population is young, they're eager, they're increasingly well educated, they're interested in the outside world. Mm -hmm. And I think the hope, you know, for I Iran lies in this uh, younger generation. Well, I join you in that hope, Shaul and Hala, and let me thank you both for this conversation, one of two that we're going to have on this topic. And Hala, Every time I see you, I'm going to say welcome. <laughs> and never <laughs> let you, you go from here. Right? It's a word I love to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paula. And Thank that's you. our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview channel which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching this week. And Shaul and Hala, thank, thank you. you. I think that was very good. Nice. <laughs> we did it. We did it.